Okay, I hope people are all back from the short lunch break. Um, it's a quite busy workshop, right? Uh, we have to, <laughs> there's no time to relax, but that's okay. Um, so <clears throat> this afternoon we will um, talk more about chirality and symmetry and tailored fields. Um, later we will have a battle coming on and before that, Olga Smirnova from Berlin will give a tutorial. I think the plan is that uh, she will speak for about 45 minutes and then uh, we can discuss some questions. Maybe if there are questions in between, I guess you would also be able to answer them. Okay, thank you, go ahead. Thank you very much for the introduction. And I would also like to thank Carla and her team for organizing and managing for several years already this amazing uh, conference and seminar series. I'm absolutely fascinated by what, by what Carla does, and I think she makes a very important contribution to our community. Thank you so much, and thanks to your team. So I'm very honored to present a tutorial on um, chorality, and my main message that I would like to convey that there is a lot to do, a lot of new interesting nonlinear effects, a lot of new interesting observables, ultra fast observables that we can develop in our community. And this is very exciting because the medium is also very interesting. I mean, the chiral medium. So um, most of the tutorial things uh, you can follow in this uh, perspective and tutorial paper, which we have published recently. So I would like to thank uh, my team and uh, Andres uh, he probably is here. Yes, here he is. He is uh, my former postdoc and he, PhD student, sorry. And he is one of the main contributors to what I will present today, as well as David. And uh, you will see also uh, contributions from Margarita and uh, Pierre de Cleva and Misha. Okay, so. What will be important for this talk is to realize that chiral molecules, they are like a little corkscrew in terms of the electronic motion that we can excite in these molecules. So if we excite the molecule like this, if we rotate the corkscrew, what happens is that the cork moves up or down depending on the rotation. So what you will see that the same behavior happens in chiral molecules, in response of chiral molecules, and that it leads to new, extremely efficient and anti-sensitive observables. But first, we need to understand how do we probe chirality. And if you think about chiral object, well, I assume that everybody knows that chiral objects, they are like my hands and molecules can be chiral and uh, my hands are two non-superimposable mirror images of each other. How would we probe it? Well, in macro world, I can just look at my hands, I can come to the mirror, and I can observe the correspondence between two objects, reflected in the mirror and the original object. And in this case, we have a method which I call chiral observer. Uh, we can probe chirality differently by interacting. For example, handshake. If my partner gives me a proper handshake, I know that the hand of my partner is right, exactly the same as I have. So, but in this method, there is interaction between two chiral objects, which is involved. And what is interesting that these two general concepts, they also are relevant for the micro world. And there will be two, type of, two types of measurements, which are related to chiral observer, and to chiral reagent. Before we talk about this method, another important thing that I have to introduce is the basic chiral observables. So I absolutely love this example, and I understand that nobody can laugh at it anymore because I show it too often, but basically it comes from the paper of two prominent theoretical physicists, Jordan and Kronik. They published it almost 100 years ago in Nature, and at that time, they were interested in chirality of cows. So what makes cows chiral? 
it's the way they chew. So the jaw of a cow makes a rotation, rotating motion, but the foot moves in the direction orthogonal to the rotation plane. And the basic chiral observable, what it does, it just takes these two directions, information about these two movements of jaw and a current, and makes one observable out of it. So what happens is that we basically just need to take a scalar product between direction of a foot, which is described by a foot vector, and rotation of a jaw, which is described by the angular momentum of a jaw. And then the basic chiral measure is a pseudoscalar, which is a scalar product of these two vectors. And it is ideally suited to characterize chiral systems because it changes sign upon reflection. And of course, we also see from this, because we know that angular momentum is a vector product of these two vectors, R and P, we also see that basic chiral measure is a triple product of vectors. Now, what is important that every chiral object carries at least one pseudoscalar with it. But there could be more pseudoscalars, and you can address them. So now the question is, uh, how do we measure these pseudoscalars? Because what we measure in the experiments, we really measure clicks, and clicks are scalars. So the question is, how do we access these molecular pseudoscalars or chiral pseudoscalars in our measurement? And to answer this question, let us consider the uh, most, uh, probably the oldest chiral technique, which is called absorption chiral decreasing. So the molecule, chiral molecule, interacts with circular polarized light, and uh, the difference in absorption depends of the circular polarized light with chiral molecule depends on the uh, rotation, on the chirality of this field. So the circular polarized field makes a helix in space, it's a chiral object, and here we have a chiral reagent type measurement. So there is real interaction between chiral object, which is light, and chiral molecule. And the measure that we detect is a scalar, but it is given by a product of molecular pseudoscalar and light pseudoscalar. And the reason why we have two pseudoscalars is because we need to convert molecular pseudoscalar into a scalar measurement. So this is the concept, and this explains why you need two chiral objects to measure scalar observables. But we have also other observables. For example, we can measure vectors. And uh, this is a very famous uh, example of a chiral effect in uh, molecular photonization. And the reason why it's very famous because it's a very, very strong chiral effect. So, so what happens here? It's you perform photonization with circular polarized pulse and you detect electron with the momentum K. Now, if you send your pulse, circular polarized pulse, into the randomly oriented ensemble of molecules, and you set up your detectors in such a way that they are along the propagation vector of the laser field, but are in the opposite directions. So what you will observe that more electrons will go to forward detector than to backward detector for right molecules. But if you change molecular handedness, then more electrons will go to backward detector than to forward detector, which means we have net an anti-sensitive current, and it swaps its direction if we change helicity of uh, change direction of rotation of circular polarized light, and if we swap molecular handedness. What is important for us now is that we measure vectorial observable. We measure current. And uh, if we measure a vector and we want to hide molecular pseudoscalar into our measurement, obviously we need to multiply it by the pseudo vector. And in the interaction of molecule with light, the pseudo vectors actually can come from light. And uh, this is precisely what happens in uh, this PCD effect. You have a polarization 
of the laser field, circular polarized field, which determines a plane, oriented plane, and then you supplement your setup with two electrons. In the end, you have a defined a chiral coordinate system. But this chiral coordinate system is a composite system. None of this object is chiral by itself. Here we look at light in the electric dipole approximation, and it is really not chiral. And the detector is also not chiral, but the combination gives us the, that gives us the coordinate system in which we can measure chirality. Now, what you can then, once you measure your vector, again, look at the click. It's a projection of this vector on the detector axis Z. And what you have that you again, for the click, you again have a product of molecular pseudoscalar times light pseudo, sorry, times setup pseudoscalar. And what is important that this setup is really composite. So the, uh, this, this uh, setup pseudoscalar is really composite. It contains from the pseudo vector of light and the vector of a detector. So in the electric dipole approximation, circular polarized light does not have its own pseudoscalar. It cannot provide it. But what can happen that it can borrow this uh, additional vector to form the setup pseudoscalar from two basically parts of non-chiral systems. So this is in fact a very important concept because it allows you to think about your experiment in a very flexible way and select completely different laboratory setups for measuring the chiral dynamics. So it does not have to be chiral light all the time. It can be very nice setting in which you measure fragments, electrons, three vectors. Okay, so now that is our challenge. The challenge for us is that standard circular polarized pulse, uh, circular polarized field, which traces helix in space, and this is a chiral structure. It's very hard to apply it to detecting chiral molecules simply because the scale of molecular chirality is much smaller than the scale of the uh, chirality of light. And that is particularly challenging for ultra-fast measurements. So um, what I'm going to uh, talk now, I'm going to give you an example of an efficient reagent, which is the um, light, which can interact, which is chiral in electric dipole approximation. So the solution for this uh, trouble that we have here is one of the solutions, is to go away from the inefficient chiral reagent, and we can substitute it by two various uh, concepts. One would be chiral observer, and it works in the electric dipole approximation, and the other efficient chiral reagent. And the idea here is really to change a way in which you encode chirality in light. You encode it not in the spatial uh, profile, but you encode it in the sub-cycle trajectory. So, and um, we start with this, and uh, this is the solution that we have come up with uh, David, uh, Andres, and Ofer, who is here, and Oren Cohen. So the concept is the following. So our trouble is that if we look at the circular polarized light, at a given point locally for the molecule, then of course it represents a planar circle. And uh, because of that, the chiral decrease is extremely small. So the idea is to take the circle and bend it into a three-dimensional chiral shape, chiral decision figure. And you can do this combining light of several colors. And then what happens is that electric field vector traces a chiral trajectory within one cycle and the electrons in the molecule can feel the pull from this three-dimensional field basically locally. Now, how to characterize this light? Of course, when we introduced this light, it was not clear how to characterize it. And we took inspiration from chiral cows. So I told you that we can use this uh, 
triple product of uh, vectors. And this is exactly what I what we did. We took the what about we trace this trajectory in time? We take the snapshot of the electric field polarization vector in three successive moments of time, and we form a triple product, just like it is shown here. If this triple product is non-zero, it means that the electric field vector traced really chiral trajectory. Now, what would you require is that this trajectory remains chiral on the average of uh, one period, so of the, of the cycle. And then if you go to Fourier domain, then the condition for that is very simple. You need to have three colors in your field and they should have non-collinear uh, directions. So the polarizations at these different frequencies should be non-collinear. Um, but uh, what is also interesting about this measure, that it turns out that it actually also characterizes the strengths of a 90 sensitive interaction of light with matter in electric dipole approximation. And um, what happens is that the, you can also build higher orders of this correlation function, and you will discover that each order of this function describes the enanti sensitivity of a given multi photon pathway. So you can have, um, you can characterize the enanti sensitivity of every multi photon pathway basically separately. So uh, this light is also possible to do. And because you need a combination of basically because you need uh, the electric vector of the field to trace three-dimensional chiral shape, of course, you need a non-collinear configuration of pulses in which you will then have all polarizations present in all 3D. So uh, I will not uh, describe the setup. You probably heard about it before. What I want to say that uh, we have an absolutely fantastic preliminary news that in 2023, this has been realized in the lab by Rose, David, Mary, and John. And uh, this is very exciting. And after that, of course, laser broke. So <laughs> now, once we have realized that we can control the hiddenness of the light locally, why don't we ask a question if we cannot, if we can control it globally? For example, we could structure the hiddenness of light in space in principle at our will. So what I show here in the slide, I illustrate how you can structure it. So if just one rotation like this uh, presents a dancing figure, basically a specific Lissajou figure, then you can construct a dancing pattern. So alternating uh, areas in space where you have local chirality, uh, positive or negative. And uh, then what's going to happen? So what's going to happen in the near field that every parametric process will be modulated, there will be a phase modulation of the any parametric process uh, with this phase. And so the emitters in this part and in this part will be exactly out of phase, which means you modulate your signal in space, uh, phase of the signal. So we know what are the far field consequences of such phase modulation. And this is what you see here. Basically what you get, you get the bending of light uh, so what you see here is a result for high harmonic generation uh, on, fan uh, on propylene oxide for harmonic 12. And if the light, this light with this structure interacts, so on the horizontal axis is the transversal coordinate. And uh, what you see on the vertical axis is the correlation function of light, which characterizes its headedness and its interaction with matter. And because correlation function changes sign here from this to this, so does the response in the overall medium. And the result of this is the bending of light. So if this light interacts with left molecules, it bends to the left. And if it interacts with right molecules, it bends to the right. But because it is also true for every parametric process, Margarita was particularly excited to look at the free induction decay. So you can do the same phase, impart the same phase in free induction decay, and then you can also see this deflection uh, of the uh, free induction decay light. 
So, but next idea would be that once we managed to uh, modulate headliness uh, in one dimension, why don't we think about modulating headliness in two dimensions and in particular connect topological and chiral properties of light? And uh, topological properties are global and chiral properties are local. And this can be done by combining uh, local chirality, combining locally chiral field with uh, vortex beams. And vortex beams are the topological objects. And to realize this, we use uh, tightly focused uh, counter rotating omega plus two omega vortex beams, such that omega has the angular momentum of one, two omega has angular momentum minus one. And because they are tightly focused, of course, they develop longitudinal component because of the uh, confinement in transverse direction. And then you have locally chiral Lissajou figure of this light, but you also have uh, global topological features. And how these topological features manifest itself? So if you look at the intensity of your beam, it will be like this, a donut shape. So then if you look at the correlation function here of the fifth order, lowest order correlation function for this process, then it will be like donut like this, um, in meaning that within this donut, you have a chiral light. But most interesting part happens in the argument of this function. And if you plot the argument, you will see that the phase of this correlation function changes from zero to pi six times as we go along this uh, vortex point. And what happens is that uh, we imparted on our correlation function two phases. One is global, topological, and you see it, is, um, dep it depends on the azimuthal angle and it's controlled by so-called topological charge. So this number that we have six, um, six time change of the phase, uh, this is precisely due to this topological number. And the topological number can be derived analytically for this light. And it includes basically parameters of your input beams and it can be uh, quite flexible. So what is uh, cool about it is that, so this topological uh, charge is the property of the chiral topological light. So now what is really nice is that if you apply this to again, uh, for example, tension and look at the, for example, harmonic 18, what you will see that because of this modulation uh, of intensity, which comes from the fact that you have topological phase, chiral phase, and molecular phase. So the, because of this uh, topological property, you have six hotspots in the near field. And if you look at right and left function, you will see that the angle of rotation changes, overall angle of rotation of this pattern changes, and the difference of the angle between left and right and antimer is a robust quantity because it's, it's fully characterized by this uh, topological charge. And uh, what you can do next, you can ask if this could allow us to measure um, small traces of chiral molecules. For example, when we have mixtures and the mixtures you characterize the chirality of the mixture by an antimeric axis, which is the difference between left and right molecules divided by the sum. So what we have plotted is um, an antimeric axis, and it's a bit difficult to look at this graph right now because you have no idea what is plotted. So on the horizontal axis is the angle. So this angle in far field, azimuthal angle. Now on the vertical axis is the antimeric axis. This six time oscillating image is just basically taking radial image and putting it like this. And what I now want to follow, I want to follow minima of the signal as a function of an antimeric axis. And of course, because there is a different angle for right molecules and left molecules, uh, what you have a sharp step here because at zero and antimeric axis, you don't have these topological structures at all. So topology changes in this sense. And uh, we hope that that could give us a robust access to very small traces of an antimeric axis, but there is a lot of work to do 
to actually work on it. So now it's a moment where I would like to bring this idea that really excites me, which is try to connect topological properties and chiral properties in observables. And the idea why I would like to do this, because topological observables, they usually possess robustness. And it would be really fantastic to have robust chiral observables. So I give a very kindergarten um, few slides about uh, topology. And uh, of course, you know at this level all that um, we have these objects which are topologically different. And they are also robust in the sense that if you change a little bit, uh, here the three uh, holes still remain. So now the question is, um, do we need a local input to characterize these global properties? And uh, how to characterize, for example, 2D surface locally? And what most of you also, of course, know uh, that uh, the breakthrough in understanding of characterization um, two-dimensional surfaces which are not embedded in 3D was due to Riemann. And what he realized that uh, you really need to run trajectories on your surface, so you need to live on the surface. If you are not embedded, you really have to be on the surface. And uh, then uh, one of the qualitative um, illustrations that I have chosen to show is that if you walk on this surface and uh, then you see that there is a curvature of the surface because the angle is accumulated between this position and this position. But if you walk in space, work, if you walk in flat space, then there is no phase accumulated. So this phase, which is accumulated due to geometry of the, phase, of the surface, is a geometric phase. And curvature, which is a local parameter, it's basically differential value of the geometric phase. It's density of the geometric phase. So geometric phase per unit, square unit of, of this sphere. And uh, finally, topological invariant, which is particularly interesting because it provides the robustness. It's a integral value that obtains from local curvature, typically integrating over all uh, surface. So why is it relevant for us? It's relevant because uh, it turns out that topology plays a very important role in um, observables and is just an alternative way of looking at them. For example, uh, if you have a device shown here, which have a dynamical device, which has two angles, so the full dynamic, full configuration space of this device can be represented on a torus because there is one angle like this and the other angle like that. And uh, the shape of this configuration space naturally affects trajectories. And suppose this is some uh, material in which we have electrons which are moving on this torus. So electron trajectories I plot here and uh, obviously qualitatively, uh, because the trajectories are curved, you will generate certain fields. And these fields will be generated only because of the geometry. And uh, these fields will record the geometry or topology of this configuration or parameter space. And the, it comes then to a key concept of geometric field and curvature that uh, we discussed on the first slide, a previous slide is one of such fields. And uh, what is also known that this curvature has been extremely useful in um, solid state um, in solid state science because it allowed uh, to introduce the new phases of materials, which are topological phases, and it also allowed to obtain new types of observables, which are topologically robust observables. And then the question is, we have chiral molecule. It's obviously that it's a chirality is a geometric property. And it's obviously that it's hard to translate one into another without uh, um, really, really big changes. So the question is, are there geometric fields also in chiral molecules? And if they are, can it lead to an antisensitive observables, new and antisensitive observables, which critically depends on these geometric fields? So, and to uh, discuss this topic, I now go back to my track in which I present uh, two different methods. 
observer reagent, reagent we already discussed, we uh, looked at the very efficient reagent synthetic chiral light, now we will look at the observer. And uh, this observer method is what we do with the photoelectron circular decryism. We come back to this phenomenon simply because it's, it's really a terrific phenomenon. Okay, so you still probably remember uh, what was the setting. We have a net photoelectron current. And uh, what um, we discovered that actually this uh, photoelectron current which is uh, famous because it's a very strong uh, chiral observable in outside of the, uh, within the electric dipole approximation, the signal can be 60% of the total signal. So it was one of a kind. But what we realized that it's not really one of a kind. There is an entire iceberg of other observables which are partially not known, partially known. And uh, this Iceberg basically is all defined by a geometric field. So now the story of this geometric field. What happened is that together with Andres, we managed to write the uh, anti-sensitive current as a, in, in such a form, which is a little bit similar to how people in solids would write it. So there is a kind of conductivity, and uh, then there is this pseudo vector of light. So this is a molecular pseudo scalar. So this molecular CD scale turned out to be a flux of a certain field. And the field is given by the vector product of two photonization dipoles. Photonization dipole and its complex conjugate. So it's the same dipole, but dipole and its complex conjugate. Now, the parameter of this field is the photoelectron momentum. And the flux is really in the momentum space through the sphere, which presents the energy shell for the electron. So now what we have obtained very recently is that uh, it turns out that this geometric field uh, is related to completely rigorously mathematically related to Berry curvature. And the Berry curvature actually appears because of the decoupling electronic and rotational degrees of freedom in molecules. And there is also associated Berry phase, which is observable because it's mathematically equivalent to an anti-sensitive part of photonization yield. And then you get results like this and you know a little bit follow what happens in solids. You say, oh, wow, maybe we can, can get quantized and anti-sensitive observables. I will not uh, present any of that because we have not done this, but this is the hope. But what I tell you is that this very curvature, this realization that it can um, emerge and also understanding what are its symmetry properties allows us to establish new observables which were not known before. So it's not just a mathematical uh, object for the pleasure of theorists who love this object. Well, I'm not going to pretend I don't love it, but um, it's really useful as Hugo also pointed out about his uh, pet. So now, uh, what is important is that if we start ionization from a real state, then this uh, Berry curvature is equal to zero. And uh, in this case, you cannot make use of anything obviously related to this Berry curvature. But if you first excite dynamics uh, in a superposition of states and photonize them, then this Berry curvature is non-zero. It will be always non-zero when you break time reversal symmetry. So if you consider spin, it will also be non-zero. And we are working on, on that right now to show the, how spin interacts with this field. Now, but here is the effect which we discovered only because we uh, knew about this field. So the effect is uh, an anti-sensitive molecular orientation by photonization. So what happens is that you excite your molecules with linearly polarized pulse. After that, you generate a current. So current, for example, in a molecular frame goes from me to you. Now, let me, because I'm going to um, show the anti-sensitive orientation, it's important to consider two copies of the same molecule oriented oppositely and show where is the breaking of symmetry between them happens. Okay, so breaking of symmetry is a combination of a current and the subsequent field. 
So current in one molecule, for example, in this one, goes from me to you. In the molecular frame for this molecule, the situation will be exactly the same, but this molecule oriented oppositely in the light in the lab frame. What is next important to remember that molecules are corkscrews, which means the current which goes from me to you in the right molecule will induce twisted current which rotates to right. And this is a feature of chiral molecule, in normal molecule that will not happen. But from the laboratory frame of the other molecule, the current will be rotating to the left. And therefore, when the next, uh, when the circular polarized field comes, it will see the difference in photonization because in one case, you, you have a co-rotating current to the rotation of the field. And here you have counter-rotating. So this ionization will be suppressed. So the, the formal way to describe it is to observe that linearly polarized pulse excites bound electron current and generates Berry curvature. So basically Berry curvature describes this twisted current. And uh, then uh, molecules in which Berry curvature is oriented along the propagation axis will win. So they will be preferentially ionized. So that is what breaks symmetry and the effect turned out to be uh, relatively large. So out of 100 of ions produced, 60, have, uh, 60 will be oriented like this and uh, 40 will be oriented oppositely. What is important here is that you can control the direction of this Berry curvature by exciting different orbitals because Berry curvature reflects the current and if you excite different superpositions, you can have current going in different directions. So basically you can orient molecule any way you want because you can excite the vector, molecular frame vector, which aligns itself, orients itself along the propagation. What is also very important, and I'm looking at, uh, at uh, Françoise because I put uh, her very important uh, seminal picture here. So what I have described to you just now, this is an example of an anti-sensitive charge directed reactivity because it's a direction of the current that fully defines the orientation of molecule and therefore the direction in which fragments will move. So uh, this is just to illustrate uh, what I have already said. So what is important that because the Berry curvature is at the origin of this effect and because it can only happen if you break time reversal symmetry, you have a 100% situation. The effect will not happen if there is no current in the system. So it's really all these observables, they are messengers of an anti-sensitive charge directed reactivity. And this is what I find extremely satisfying for the reason that we tried a lot to excite various, um, to, to, to apply various setups to, pro to prove that with the photonization, we can characterize the, the, the current in bound states. But whenever you do this, you always get both quadratures of the oscillating signal, one which oscillates with sine and the other which oscillates with, with cosine and is signal is not zero if there is no current. So here is a situation when you will surely have signal only when you have current. So I'm close to um, probably uh, to, uh, the end of the talk and uh, what I would like to tell you that this geometric field allows us to have a classification of an anti-sensitive observables and photonization and they are all de depend on this um, field that we discovered with Andres and uh, first class of observables are vectorial observables and uh, these are vectorial observ any vectorial observable of a cation. Uh, the second class are observables that rely on the radial component of the geometric field. So what you have here, you, you have your geometric field in molecular frame, and then you average over all orientations of K, and then you get a quantity here. And here you, what you do, you do averaging over orientation, basically of the radial component only. And this is PCD and time-dependent PCD. 
And finally, the third class are all kinds of tensorial observables, which are coming from multipolar expansion of this field. So um, we have recently measured one of this observable, which was also predicted earlier than us by Philip Demechen and uh, Thomas Baumer. So we, we had a proposal at Fermi and we measured this observable. I probably do not have time to go through it, but you can ask me um, later questions. And what I would like to say in the end of my talk is really to give a tribute to the community because we have an absolutely amazing community which came up with many new methods just over a, say, decade maybe. And so what we have now, we have chiral observer method which are working in completely different frequency regimes. We have this um, in anti-sensitive microwave spectroscopy, which is actually um, also an observer method. We have PCD, we have this PXCD, PXCD, whatever. So the important property, chiral observer is defined by configuration of non-chiral electromagnetic fields and detectors. And this enables chiral discrimination in all cases. All this technique yield very strong signal and can follow chiral dynamics on various time scales, from electronic to vibronic to rotational. And they all require vectorial observables, such as induced polarization or photoelectron current. Tensorial observables can also be measured. And this is the work, I would like to highlight the work of uh, Philip Demechen and Thomas Baumer, as well as a Bardot-Weizmann collaboration Sara Rosen, Jan Mares, uh, Valery Blanchet, Neri Dudovich. So well, finally, <laughs> I have to also uh, give uh, credit to community in terms of chiral reagent methods. So there is also a family of methods already um, appearing, which share the same origin, the same properties, and the same strong sensitivity. So there is a synthetic chiral light that we developed with David. There is a much earlier paper, which we did not know at all, and we discovered it later, that basically also introduces the synthetic chiral light, but for three colors. The reason we did not go originally with a three color configuration, but did two color configuration, because the three color configuration cannot maintain global headlandness. Okay, I would also like to point out this very interesting work, which tries to connect uh, chorality and topology. Uh, and so there is uh, synthetic chiral light. There are chiral configurations of electric fields because you can also produce chiral configurations, for example, from circular polarized field and static field. And that was explored here. And uh, you can have a chiral configuration of microwave fields, which are um, three color superposition and there is no issues with global chorality because this uh, wavelength is just large so you don't have uh, effects detrimental effects that we have in optics and here there is an amazing completely amazing activity going in micro microwaves completely different field different setups different physics different um, devices you use in the lab but the method is exactly the same. And if you write it in terms of pseudo-scalar and pseudo-vector, you'll get absolutely the same um, expressions up to changing your notations. So that's all. Um, yes, I guess that was the plan. So we're going to have five minutes break, just that we can set the people up, but it will be very short. And then we can ah, sorry, right. talk. But, but first we, we will have some questions and, and then we'll have a break, right? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> It's a busy day. So thank you, Olga, for this uh, for this introduction to chorality. Are there questions? I'll have a few questions if you don't ask. John. Ah, sorry. Not, not really a question, uh, a comment. I really love the talk and it's really fascinating. And I think this is really amazing technological as well as scientific opportunities emerging. But just a comment about the um, the uh, sensitivity of chiral, uh, of, of circular dichroism in absorption. Of course, now we have 
circularly polarized X-rays from free electron lasers and, and, and synchrotrons, I think such methods will become more uh, accessible. So just, a, just a comment. Absolutely, absolutely. Because the signal will grow, go up with the frequency. Yes. Thank you. I think there was another question somewhere or not. Then I'll have a question. Um, so uh, there's one thing I don't understand about chirality. So I understand that uh, if you have some static shape, like a hand or whatever, uh, you can define chirality uh, as meaning you cannot superimpose it with its mirror image. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that. Um, okay, but you're also talking about time-dependent mm -hmm. objects. And uh, for example, you showed this correlation uh, function uh, that you say is the quantity that measures chirality. So I was wondering what is actually the definition of a time-dependent uh, object? What makes it chiral? Is there something simple like superposing it with its mirror image or not? Yes, so basically offer who is sitting here uh, together with Oren, they introduce dynamical symmetries to characterize uh, chirality in this case. So uh, you can introduce basically symmetries in time to, to, to reflect the fact that you have time evolution. And if you change direction of rotation, for example, in, in this uh, light that I have shown in this one, it changes the chirality. So it's an extended set of symmetries that you uh, describe. And within the set, you look at the symmetries, for example, changing, shifting your pulse in time by half a period. Shifting your pulse, you know, like symmetries of rotation, you always consider like what would be half of rotation, what will do to my system. And then I define if it's the same, I define a group and so on and so forth. So you do exact same, but just consider time as the additional kind of parameter or axis, something like this. So it's rigorously possible. Okay, thank you, Robert. I have a maybe a stupid question. You explained nicely that you discuss all your work in the dipole approximation, described the laser electric field, and then it came into my, into my mind that there is also a laser magnetic field. And that they, this, this breaks, for example, the forward backward uh, uh, symmetry. Absolutely. For linear polar slide. Absolutely. For, for so kind of, uh, so the, the effects which are. Is this negligible? Is yes, this okay? it's very small. It's not important. So this is this thing, precisely this curves. So this thing. So the helix has such shape because it's non local, and magnetic field is basically completely due to non-locality. So if we want to introduce magnetic field into our equations, all we need is to consider non-local response. So the non-locality, which we have here, because of which we have chirality, it's fully determined by the magnetic field and its, and its interaction with matter. But, but because matter responds to magnetic field weakly, so if you consider this for the, for the the CD effect, which can be 60%, well, the effects from magnetic field will be kind of like this. But nevertheless, there are experiments which uh, look, yeah, so there is important difference. The PCD is observer method. So you can measure vectors, but total yield will not be affected. The chiral light, it has a pseudoscalar. So it is a reagent method, which means that if you would look at ionization and extend it to magnetic field, you will see different yields of ions. So these experiments has been, have been done in the lab of um, Carmichael Weitzel in uh, Marburg. So he, for a very long time, he invested really a lot of time in these investigations and they are very interesting. And sometimes he see large effects uh, for very long nanosecond pulses. And, and I think there are still some puzzles uh, in, in this, but large, of course, not 60%, but say, I think he has numbers like 10%, but mostly it's 4-2, which is also amazingly big. So this is also possible, definitely. It should not be neglected. 
No, I mean, neglected, not, not in the calculations. I mean, one should keep in mind that this is also important method. For example, for high energy. Then... Yeah, for high energy. Yeah, it's important method. I did not want to put it down. It just turned out that I did so, but I didn't really intend. So it's important method. One should keep eye on it. Thank you. I think there was another question in the back. Not anymore. But so you were asking about like we have hands and then how we know that of course we cannot superpose the right hand on the left. Uh, but how do we do this uh, with uh, time dependent objects? Uh, Pick up. Okay. So uh, so how do we characterize the chirality of time dependent objects? So Olga gave uh, one answer, and I would like to complement that saying that in the case, for example, of the electric field, it's quite simple because then you just draw the Lissajous figure, and if the Lissajous figure itself is chiral, it, it's just the same as with the hands, right? I mean, you, you just cannot superpose that Lissajous figure on its mirror image. So it's it's that simple. It, it, the one on the right hand side. Chiral, is, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, but time goes forward yeah, in, in the experiments, I mean. Yeah, no, no. I mean, the least that you feel, yeah, of course. I mean, it, in that sense, that's the color in that, in that least that you feel. Yeah, so you have to take into account the color as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. More questions? No? Sure. We need to have understood everything about chirality before we go into the battle. So think once again. <laughs> okay. No more questions. Thank you, Olga, for this tutorial. And now we'll have a five minute break uh, to set up the battle that will be coming. Yes. Okay, welcome back from the short break. Everybody grab your seat. Good, so now we are coming to the most exciting part of the day. Uh, now we're coming to the first quantum battle. So the idea is that here we have four competents who will explain their ideas about the topic of chirality, symmetry, and tailored fields. Um, I think this will be very exciting. We have uh, four different countries here. Um, <laughs> sitting in the first row, we have uh, Ufa Neufeld. He's at the moment at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. Then we have Catherine Hamilton from University of Colorado at Denver. Then here we have Dino Habibovic from Sarajevo, and we have Laura Rego from Madrid. Um, okay, so uh, there is one important thing. Uh, we will listen uh, to what they have to say about this topic, uh, and they will also include some polls uh, that you can answer during the talk. But to answer them, it's necessary that you go into the Zoom um link that you have received so um please if possible um open the zoom meeting uh, using uh, the link um day yourselves. one of the quantum and battles mute. Yeah. and mute and mute your devices uh on your device switch off the microphone and the speaker otherwise we get in big trouble uh, otherwise, UCL will explode due to a massive feedback loop that we create. Okay, so th this will uh, come up a bit later, I think. So you still have time to uh, open your Zoom. 
And uh, yeah, now I'll hand over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Manfred, for the introduction. And I guess we'll start this uh, battle slash presentation slash talk. I don't know. Um, so the first kind of order of business, I think, which we want to start with. Yes, no. Okay. No. It worked a minute. It did. It did. But now it doesn't. There we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now it's working. Okay. Both. Great. Both. Yeah. Okay. Well, so the first thing that we want to talk about is just like properly define when something is chiral, right? So this word kind of gets thrown around quite a lot. People use it kind of very easily sometimes. And uh, I think like before we start this, this entire journey, it's going to be good to really like properly define chirality kind of both on a mathematical level and also kind of more intuitively. So when we say something is chiral, really what we mean is that there's some inherent connection between the object and its symmetry properties. So the two topics are actually connected. And actually when we say something is chiral, we mean that that certain object is asymmetric. So it lacks a certain kind of symmetries and this is what actually makes it chiral. Um, and this is completely like analogous to the more kind of verbal definition of an object that can't be superposed onto its uh, mirror image. So those two are equivalent. And I give here like two examples of objects that are, or let's say images that are achiral, right? So these two architectural, let's say settings, um, and they're achiral because they have this kind of reflection plane in them. And this makes each image identical to its own mirror image, right? So actually this, this achirality is coming from the symmetry. But then if you have some chiral object, let's say this, this like weird opera house, then this thing doesn't have any more of these like reflection or inversion type symmetries. And this is actually what makes it chiral. Um, and this property, this chirality, it's a very ubiquitous thing in nature. So it appears all around us, right? We're like very sensitive with our eyes to whether something is symmetric or not. And it kind of goes through length scales. So you could have chiral galaxies, you know, biological objects on all scales, meters, centimeters, and so on. And chiral molecules, of course, including biomolecules, like Olga talked about, and we're going to talk about more, but also like fundamental particles, right? So if you go all the way down to the picometer scale, so fermions could be chiral, and this maybe is defined a little bit differently, but mathematically it's the same thing. So it's just the lack of a certain symmetry. Um, and of course, for us, like the more important thing is molecules. I think this is kind of the the the, the thing we're going to talk about the most here. So molecules can be chiral. We have these pair, these uh, enantiomer uh, mirror images that Olga talked about. And I just wanted to define also this, like the symmetry definition here. So if you wanna say if a molecule is chiral or not, you just go to the point group of that molecule and go and see what, you know, what symmetries are in the point group. And if there are no reflections, inversions or improper rotations, then this is a chiral system. And then we could also have, of course, uh, chiral electromagnetic fields, you know, like circularly polarized light and so on. So all of these phenomena are essentially connected. Um, yeah. Okay, and it's gone again. Maybe this one. Yeah, yours as well. Yes. Okay, well, there we go. And then, so the next thing that we thought is good to introduce is why at all we're talking about this here. So actually this is maybe an improper slide after all the talks today. But still, like, it's a worthwhile question. Like, why at all are we talking about chirality in the context of extreme nonlinear optics, right? Um, so to understand this, it's first helpful to understand how typically chirality is probed before going to nonlinear optics, so in the linear optic sense. So in this sense, typically, uh, what people do is this kind of, like, chiroptical methodologies, all good discuss them. So, like, circular dichroism, right? So you um, shine some circularly polarized laser, which is a chiral object, onto your medium that is chiral, and then you get this like chiral chiral interaction. You measure some observable, like uh, let's say absorption, and there's some discrimination. So the signal depends now on the chirality, the hand in the receiver of the light, or or the hand in of the molecule. And like Olga mentioned, like this signal is typically very weak. Of course, you could get it to be stronger doing different things, like going to X-ray. But typically, it's very weak. And there's a bunch of different ways to understand why it's weak, um, like the length scales, but I want to introduce like one thing that I think is very helpful on an intuitive level to understand why it's so weak. So typically the strongest like light matter interaction that we have is the dipole 
uh, like the electric dipole response, right? But in the electric dipole approximation, we're completely neglecting like the spatial degrees of freedom of the electromagnetic field, right? We just have a time dependent vector. Um, but this spatial degree of freedom is actually what defines the direction of propagation of the light field, right? If it's going like towards us or the other way, like we can't know that without having a spatial sense of the field. And then if you think about kind of what the molecule sees, so if there's a molecule and there's the circularly polarized field coming towards it, so in the dipole approximation, like this molecule can't differentiate if the field is right circularly polarized and coming head on, or if it's left circularly polarized, but coming from the other side. So this already tells you that like within the dipole approximation, there's not gonna be any strong chiral interactions unless you do something like very special. Um, and this is why typically you have these magnetic or electric quadrupole interactions. But then, so in, in the nonlinear kind of regime, so this is why, you know, why we're talking about this in the extreme nonlinear regime, we can get like basically much larger signals. So we can have much larger signals. We get more data because we're recording like wider broad range spectra. We can get better temporal resolution. So contemplate, you know, doing exactly the same thing, but now taking some strong laser field here to generate, let's say harmonics, instead of measuring just like absorption spectra. Um, and this already can give like very strong chiral signals. So it's been demonstrated also experimentally and there's a bunch of different methods. I'm not showing, of course, all references. I'm just showing like one very nice experimental work from Hans Jakob Werner's group, where they do this with tailored light. So with bicircular counter rotating fields and you get very, very strong chiral signals. Um, and these are basically coming about because of the nonlinearity of the process. And you can also get these types of signals in photoionization and, and many other observables. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Ofer. So Ofer has very kindly shown us some of the tools we can use to probe chirality. Um, but at the end of the day, these are all fundamentally the interaction with light, with atoms or molecules. And as theorists, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox to study these kinds of processes. And this is where I might accidentally start a battle. So I'm trying to be as general as possible here when I mention some of these methods. But these are things like perturbation theory, the single active electron approach, strong field approximation, or multi-electron methods. And each of them perhaps has their own range of applicability or their own positives or conflicts. Um, negatives when we go to apply them to a particular process. And, you know, our choice on which method to use ideally is based on the actual physics of the problem we want to look at. So some of these methods won't capture certain processes and some of them will, I don't want to say over describe, but aren't necessary. In reality, often the method we choose is based on perhaps familiarity in a lot of cases. Uh, so I'm someone who uses exclusively a multi-electron code, and when I've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, um, but I don't always need to use that. And it also sometimes depends our choice on actual the cost to run. So how much computational resource do we need? How many human hours do we need to devote on actually getting this kind of code up and running? Uh, and perhaps in our discussion on Friday about software sustainability, we'll touch more on that. But now that we have these theoretical treatments, let's go and apply them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will first use an opportunity to thank the organizers for inviting me for this quantum battle. Uh, well, uh, I, would, I would like to continue this presentation by talking about uh, one particular method to produce elliptically polarized light with controllable ellipticity. Uh, in order to do that, we can actually use the generation of elliptically polarized high order harmonics, uh, a well-known process which we talked about this uh, earlier this day. Uh, however, in order to produce elliptically polarized light, we already know that the simplest configuration, uh, which assumes that we are using linearly polarized field and the atomic targets is not very suitable. Why is not suitable? Because in this case, the emitted harmonics are linearly polarized. That means that in order to produce elliptically light, uh, elliptically polarized light, we actually need the tailored laser fields. Um, the tailored laser fields are actually um, bichromatic fields, which consist of two either linearly or elliptically polarized components, and uh, they provide us with various parameters, which can be actually used in order to control the process. Uh, uh, however, one of the most prominent examples of the tailored laser fields is the well-known bicircular field, which consists of two, of two circularly polarized components. Uh, another example includes the 
a field which consists of two linearly polarized components, and the angle between the polarizations of these two linearly polarized components is also an active parameter. If this angle, we are calling it the crossing angle, is equal exactly to 90 degrees, we are talking about OTC, orthogonally polarized two color field. However, as we as we are going to see in the next in the next slide, the other values are also beneficial for some experimental purposes. Uh, here in the left part of this slide, you can see the Lissajous figures of some of these configurations. Uh, of the, the black line corresponds to the electric field, while the red, red line corresponds to the corresponding vector potential. Okay, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, method which can be used to produce elliptically polarized light is actually assumes that we are using atomic targets. However, we are using here the two linearly polarized fields with the angle slightly lower than 90 degrees. Here, we are interested for the omega-2 omega configuration. In this case, both odd harmonics, that's the upper panels and the, uh, and the even harmonics in the lower panels shown are emitted. Maybe, maybe, maybe Offer is gonna tell us something more about this because uh, the selection rules, which harmonics can be found in, in the spectrum depend on the symmetry properties in this case of the, of the driving laser field. Um, uh, why we have chosen the uh, crossing angle slightly lower than 90 degrees? Because if the crossing angle is 90 degrees, if we have an OTC field, the emitted harmonics are linearly polarized. However, as you can see in all the panels shown here, uh, when the crossing angle only even slightly deviates from 90 degrees, the emitted harmonics become elliptically polarized. Here, I have presented the harmonic ellipticity as a function of the harmonic energy and the relative phase between the laser field parameters. And you can see that for various values of the relative phase, you can find the elliptically polarized harmonics. Uh, this ellipticity can be controlled using this relative phase as a control parameter. However, the other parameters, for example, the ratio of the frequencies of the two driving field components or the ratio of the intensities of the driving field components can, can also successfully be used to control uh, the harmonic ellipticity and, of course, the harmonic intensity. Uh, here I have presented one another example using the omega-3 omega configuration. And as you can see, both the harmonic intensity and the harmonic ellipticity are, are quite significant. Um, the region where the, uh, the regions where the harmonic ellipticity is large can appear in the low or in the medium or in the high energy part of the spectrum, again, depending on the values of the driving field, uh, values of the driving field parameters. So that is the reason why the tailored laser fields, one of the reasons why the tailored laser fields are important to us. They provide us with a huge number of parameters which can be used to control the process. Of course, um, we have to mention that uh, instead of the com uh, configuration which consists of two linearly polarized components, we can also use the, uh, the configuration with the elliptically polarized components. But, uh, you know, sometimes, um, at least in my opinion, when we have too many, sometimes less is more, when we have too many parameters, it can be quite difficult and quite challenging to find the exact values of these parameters which, which suits our, our, our needs. So to sum up this part of the of the of my talk, um, using the atomic targets and the Taylor laser fields, it is possible to produce elliptically polarized light. Uh, it is also possible to control the ellipticity using the driving field parameters as uh, as a control knobs. Uh, before we continue, before I continue with the molecular targets, um, I would like for us to have a pool. So now we will see how it works. Uh, in this figure, let me just briefly explain you what, what I would like to know, what I would like you to answer me. Uh, in this sketch shown here, you have actually one diatomic molecule placed in the laser field polarization plane. The molecule is AB, but let us imagine even simpler configuration. This, the configuration in which we have AA molecules, a homonuclear diatomic molecule exposed to a linearly polarized field. The question is, if we have a linearly polarized field and homonuclear diatomic molecule, uh, here it is mentioned that the emitted harmonics are linearly polarized. So is that true or false? I suggest that we now have at least one minute, maybe a bit more. Maybe a bit less. 
<laughs> maybe a bit less, depending on the number of people who are attending online. Well, yeah. this, is, this, is this is pure, pure pressure. <laughs> this is what I think. I think this is a good enough statistical sample. Like, this is not going to change, yeah. <laughs> you know. Oh my God. Yes, I think we can stop the poll. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the re results of this poll, at least people who have voted, is that true, the emitted harmonics are linearly polarized, 17 out of 19. That means 89%. And only two people, 11%, said that they are not linearly polarized. Uh, unfortunately, the correct answer is false. The emitted harmonics are, I, I, I didn't, I really didn't expect it. I didn't expect this. Uh, I mean, uh, You've not been paying attention. I mean, when we are using, there is actually, let me just mention one paper, Ho and the collaborators from the Margaret Mournain's group. There is a nice paper from 2009. Uh, a PRL paper in which they uh, experimentally checked using the N2 molecule that the harmonics emitted uh, using the, when we are using it linearly polarized field, but molecular targets, uh, they are always elliptically polarized. With molecular targets, the harmonics are always linear, uh, elliptically polarized, regardless of the type of the driving field we use. However, there is always, but, but I expect however, it. Yes. However, I think there's another earlier paper that says the ellipticity is usually very weak, isn't it? Yeah, and now I would like to say that. Uh, <laughs> this is, I must say here, there is, I must say here that there are some uh, exceptions from this rule, but those exceptions are for very special field configurations and very special molecules. You know, if the field is, I don't know, linearly polarized and you have an O2 molecule with the nodal planes, maybe something can be changed, but it's elliptically polarized. Uh, now I would like to address uh, this point. Um, uh, when, uh, generally speaking, when we are using, uh, no, we don't have actually this. It's a GANA. Uh, maybe. Again, uh, let's try that one. Uh, maybe we actually have, no. No. Okay. Now maybe you can try that. Yeah, it works good. Um, uh, when we actually using linearly polarized fields to um, induce high order harmonic generation with molecular targets, um, as a rule, the emitted harmonics have a very low ellipticity. I have checked that. I have checked this using the um, strong field approximation theory maybe one or two years ago. I thought about uh, I'm going to have a nice paper. Very, I, I have all the codes and it's going to be an easy task. However, I was very disappointed because for various values of the linearly polarized field driving field parameters, the emitted harmonics, they are elliptically polarized. However, the ellipticity is relatively small. Uh, that means that the Taylor laser fields are again, particularly important to produce the elliptically polarized light with a significant ellipticity. And uh, among many configurations, one which uh, I think it's particularly promising is the configuration which uses the uh, polar molecules, for example, heteronuclear diatomic molecules. Here we have an example of a CO molecule uh, in which, again, both odd and even harmonics are emitted. And as you can see, there are huge regions uh, in the harmonic energy relative phase plane for which the emitted harmonics are uh, elliptically polarized. Again, as for the atomic targets, the uh, where these regions are going to appear, in which part of the harmonic spectrum depend depends on the uh, driving field parameters. Um, uh, I would say that uh, I have numerically tested that um, what influences this fact that the harmonics are elliptically polarized is the uh, fact that the uh, electron probability distribution is not really homogeneous 
for the CO molecule, you know the electron is far more likely to be around the C atom than for the O atom. Um, this doesn't mean uh, that this doesn't mean that the other molecules cannot be used. For example, an O molecule or some, some similar. However, in those cases, uh, the electricity would be only slightly slightly smaller. Uh, finally, there is one problem with uh, using neutral molecules. Um, if we really want a high frequency elliptically polarized light, uh, for example, in the water window region or even beyond the water window region, um, one way to obtain this uh, light is to use a very long wavelength. However, in that case, the um, harmonic intensity drops significantly. I think one uh, lambda to the sixth, um, it's inversely proportional to the lambda to the fifth or to the sixth, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, however, we have recently suggested in our submitted paper uh, that instead of the neutral molecules, the molecular cations can also be used uh, to produce a high frequency light with a significant ellipticity. What is also, uh, now of course, those uh, cations have a much higher ionization potential so that they can withstand the higher laser field intensities without immediate, immediate further ionization. Uh, in the in the right part of this slide, I have presented the harmonic intensity and the harmonic ellipticity as a function of the molecular orientation angle. This is the angle theta L, and as you can see, for the for the harmonic intensity, it does not depend a lot to the molecular orientation angle. What would uh, what could lead us to uh, say that okay, we don't have to, uh, we don't need an ideally aligned molecules in the molecular sample. However, the harmonic electricity does depend uh, on the molecular orientation angle, except for some values of the harmonic energy. For example, if you uh, if you look in this region for the energy slightly lower than 300 electron volts. Um, you have a region in which the uh, molecular orientation does not have to be ideal in order to produce uh, the light with a with particular electricity. So uh, to sum up, uh, molecules exposed to a tailored laser fields can really successfully be employed uh, to generate elliptically polarized light. If we need a high frequency light with elliptical polarization, a longer wavelengths can be used. That is the one way we can approach the problem or the molecular cations can also be used to obtain the high frequency light. Now? Yeah, thank you very much, Dino, for talking more about like, some theoretical treatments for this method. Um, I am going to now have my list of complaints and discuss a little bit how um, treating these processes can be difficult for theory. And Hugo has already very nicely touched on this topic in his talk earlier. And Ofer then will talk about the connection between sort of symmetry and selection rules. Um, but the first thing I want to point out is for certain theoretical methods, actually describing interaction with arbitrarily polarized light can be very difficult. Or more precisely, a very computationally demanding task. So when we have arbitrarily polarized light, our uh, total magnetic quantum number is no longer conserved, as it would be with linearly polarized light. So if we break down our Hamiltonian before in the linear case, we would just have L, S, and pi symmetry blocks. But now for arbitrarily polarized light, we have L, M, L, S, and pi to keep track of as well. And for every L value, we can have 2L plus 1 M, L values. So the problem scales very, very quickly. Uh, and this is especially the case, so as Dino mentioned, if we want to perhaps generate harmonics from uh, near IR wavelengths, so perhaps 1800 nanometers and up, maybe we want to generate harmonics in the water window, okay, we will need a very large angular momentum expansion. This problem scales with about 2L squared. Uh, so we quickly run out of computational resources when we try and do this. Another difficulty for theory as well is handling things related to macroscopic propagation. Uh, and I think this could open a more fundamental question about what is the role of theory in the field? Is it to simulate experiments? Is it to do something else? Um, but at the end of the day, you know, if we want to apply both theoretical and experimental treatments to a problem, we need to be able to communicate together, okay? Or describe the same kind of physical process under similar conditions. So if we do our single atom or single molecule calculation, to try and compare with experiments, we'll also have to take into account the fact that the laser intensity profile has a Gaussian distribution. So this could span several orders of magnitude in intensity, but then how many different calculations, different intensities do we need to calculate? 
is 10 sufficient? So we need to do 20. So we need to do 100. Um, how do we take into account that range of intensities? We also have the problem of propagation through the medium. So while us theorists might all like to assume that our experimental colleagues had a diffuse gas jet, uh, that unfortunately is not always the case. So that it adds in an extra layer, you know, calculating the total bulk response of the medium, taking into account the effect, the fact that atoms or molecules in different locations will experience different electric fields. And also, especially for our molecular colleagues, there is, of course, orientation averaging as well. So our molecules will not all be perfectly aligned or anti-aligned with our laser field. So that's unique calculations to perform for each of those cases as well. Uh, and to give her another shout out, so Linda Hutchinson has a very nicely recently published paper discussing some of these effects of the R matrix with time dependence code. Uh, but our next poll and what I would like to ask you all now is, what is the most important thing, okay, when you're looking to study high harmonic generation? The single atom response or the total microscopic response? So I understand an experiment, microscopic response is your only option. For me, somebody who does single atom calculations, perhaps I think the more interesting physics occurs in the single atom response, okay? Do we really learn anything new about our system by performing the microscopic propagation other than we need to, to compare with our experimental friends? Uh, so go ahead, and there's no right or wrong answer for this one. <laughs> Let's see what the audience thinks. I did add in the fence sitting option that both are equally as important. <laughs> if you want to maintain your friendships, you can go for that one. <laughs> Okay, when this poll is over, and then I'll, I'll have to complain about this question. Okay. Let's, first, <laughs> let's first see what is the result. I'll prepare myself. <laughs> no, I will not complain about the question. I will complain about the answers. <laughs> it has stabilized. Okay, so then yeah, I think let's done. stop it. Yeah, I shouldn't have added in that option. <laughs> no, so we have a tie between both are equally as important and the single atom or molecule response. So Manfred, what's your comment? So, okay, my, my comment is, I mean, as a physicist, how is it possible to vote for answer three in this case? If I ask you this question, draw a random number between zero and one, what is the probability that you will hit exactly 0.5, right? What would you say? I think the chance is not very high. So um, the why would you think that both are equally important? This I, I cannot understand. You have to make up your mind, which is more important. So um, this you go for the most correct out of the options. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not saying it's correct. Yeah, right. But maybe um, but maybe uh, I should ask Maybe someone wants to explain why he thinks the single atom uh, response is more relevant or more interesting. Um, so you asked interesting, valuable, or useful. So who wants to argue that a single atom response is more interesting, valuable, or useful? Who has voted for the first answer and wants to make a comment? Hmm. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, does anybody want to defend answer number two? There are only two persons in the room, or maybe they are online. <laughs> it's not, uh, we don't know whether they are online or offline. I mean, I, th I would think that an experimentalist would defend number two, right? Uh, that what I would believe because an experimentalist would argue why on earth uh, do you go for a single atom response if that's not actually what you would measure in real life but I don't know I'm a theorist so I mean I cannot vote because I it is my zoom account so you know the chair doesn't vote <laughs> but uh, I would say okay maybe I'll be politically correct over three 
yeah uh, the the impossible answer number three yeah. so i should um but i think there is one important thing to keep in mind uh when people talk about macroscopic response usually uh, we have in mind atoms we have a gas of atoms um and and, and the, the problem is that the laser has a spatial dependence and we have to take that into account but please remember that for molecules, and we are talking a lot about molecules, we have also the orientation effect. So uh, we also have to coherently sum over all the possible orientations, which also goes beyond the single molecule response. Dejan wants to comment. So, uh, it also depends on the uh, kind of field, but it's different for linear field, and uh, it is a macroscopic response is uh, more important for Taylor field about which they are talking. So if you do simulation for macroscopic with Taylor field, uh, uh, you will obtain a much larger effect. Okay. Could you not suppress it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe it's time to hand yes, yeah. back to you guys. Please yeah. go ahead. I think this is actually a very interesting response and I'm very looking forward to Laura's part of, part of the battle later on because I think she'll present a pretty convincing argument for the macroscopic response as well. Um, but up next is over. No, oh, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna try and take this discussion back to the symmetry side. So we heard a lot about like numerical methods, the difficulty in how you do things and then also numerical calculations. Um, and I want to try to connect this back to kind of the, the larger scheme of this like chirality symmetry um, battle um, and connect to something like more analytical so that we can all relate to, um, which is symmetries. So if you take this typical kind of like light matter Hamiltonian, so this kind of Hamiltonian describing, I don't know, interactions of some system, you know, some molecule, some solid with electrons, with some laser field, some electric field, let's say it's written here within certain approximations, but that doesn't really matter, okay? There's some general Hamiltonian describing, let's say the, the main physics that we, we are describing. Um, and what I wanna make a point of is that the symmetries of this Hamiltonian actually determine quite a bit of, of properties of whatever observables we're looking at. So like harmonics, ATI, and so on. Um, and I wanna take note to some particularly important terms. So one of these is the term which has the molecule or solids, let's say potential. Basically this term encodes all the symmetries of your ground state sort of system, let's say. So if it's a molecule or a solid, this will have all of the rotational and proper, you know, all the symmetries of, of the solid or the molecule. But then there's this light matter term. Um, and in the strong field regime that we kind of like talk, talking about, so this term is very intense, right? So it's on kind of orders of magnitude, roughly on the same scale as the other terms. And that means that we can't just neglect it. And that term has some more interesting symmetry. So basically this one, you can tailor the symmetries if you tailor the laser fields. So Dino talked a lot about this, but this has been going on you know, for many years in many different aspects. Um, and whenever you know this, the symmetry group of the total Hamiltonian, like we can identify it, this imposes sometimes some selection rules for the emission. So even without doing the numerical calculations, we can say something about the properties of the observables. Um, and I'm gonna give one example. So this is a very old example, which was pioneered by uh, a few people in the past, including people here in this room. So this is the famous bicircular counter rotating field. You have this tailored field, which is uh, left circularly polarized omega, let's say, and it's right circularly polarized second harmonic. And the superposition of these two beams actually leads to like a field which is threefold symmetric. So it has a slightly reduced symmetry compared to let's say the, the continuous rotational symmetry of the monochromatic beam. Um, but this reduced symmetry leads to a very interesting selection rule. So it uh, leads to circularly polarized harmonics in the spectra, also some forbidden harmonics, but more generally like the, the polarization state of the harmonics is circular. And you can understand this through many different ways one of the ways is proper like symmetry. So this seminal paper derived the symmetry um, and the selection rules. And this was actually one of the first ways to generate circular harmonics. So you can use these symmetries to understand what's going on, but then also to tailor properties of the emission. Um, yeah. Okay, it's just super slow. Okay, but then more generally, so this was one example, but you could do this kind of systematically, right? I mean, this is just, finding the symmetry group of the Hamiltonian, deriving the selection rules, like this is something analytical, you could do this. 
and it has been done, you know, in many different ways. Um, I'm just referencing kind of our own work, which is this, this, this more general, let's say, description. But you can just go through all the different symmetries and for each symmetry, define a specific selection rule. So if we go back to this poll, which everyone, you know, for some reason got wrong. So if you have a uh, bilinear, like uh, AA molecule with linear light. So if you go to the symmetry perspective, it's enough to have the light like at an axis, which breaks the mirror symmetry of the molecule. Like this would tell you the harmonics are elliptical, right? Because you're breaking some symmetry of the Hamiltonian. You know, how elliptical they are, that depends like on the field, the chemical properties of the molecule and so on. But the symmetry is enough to just say that they're gonna be elliptical. Um, yeah, and you can even do this more generally. So I was talking just about like the symmetries of the time dependent polarization of the electric field. So you could have an electric field, you know, some Lisa Ju shape and, and describe the symmetry group of, the, of those type of objects. But you could also have symmetries in the spatial dependence of the field if you need like macroscopic type of effects. Um, and you could have like a combination of all of these. So you can derive a joint kind of symmetry group theory that describes all these kind of multi-scale operations that act both microscopically and macroscopically. And you could even think about doing this like in some synthetic dimension of the Hamiltonian, let's say some phase space dependency. So all of these different things would basically lead to selection rules on your observables. So harmonics, for instance, but also ATI and other observables generally. Okay, so with this, I wanna go back now to, to the chirality discussion because we mentioned that chirality is actually the absence of symmetries. And this connects to this locally chiralite or synthetic chiralite that Olga talked about and we heard quite a bit about today. Um, so I think Olga likes to present this kind of like from the mathematical side of these chiral correlation functions. Uh, but I wanna try and introduce also like the, the symmetry kind of intuition if you think about this slide. So where it comes from in terms of the symmetry. So we defined chirality of molecules as the lack of these mirror inversion symmetries, right? So if you think about this locally chiral light, so you can also kind of impose exactly the same definition. So go back to this big table of all the different possible groups of symmetries of, of your laser field, and then just choose the groups that don't have, you know, mirror inversion and proper rotations. But now do this for the more general thing. So like Manfred was talking about. So do this for the time dependent electromagnetic field and include also these dynamical types of symmetries with time translation and so on. Um, and make sure that those aren't in there as well. And when you do that, you get this locally chiral field. So it's a field that has this time-dependent polarization or this Lisa Ju shape, which is chiral in the sense that it, it is indeed different from its mirror image. So you can superpose these, but you have to take into account the, the dynamical aspect of this thing. Um, and then this is really kind of like an electromagnetic analogy to molecular chirality. So these fields are very useful to probe chiral matter, of course, like Olga discussed. So there's a bunch of different ways you could do this. I just wanna give like two other applications that I think are kind of interesting for this discussion. So one is that because this field is locally chiral, so it's chiral within the electric dipole response, um, it's very efficient for basically separating an antisensitive signals. So you could also think about probing uh, multi-chiral systems. So molecules that have more than one chirality sensor. And, and this is actually what we should all be thinking about because this is what the drug industry really needs. Um, and then an, another application is, so we're talking a lot about harmonics, but you could also think about ATI or PCD that Olga talked about. Um, so you could do PCD, but then just replace the standard circularly polarized field that you have with this locally chiral field and ask what that does. So typically this PCD would have a bunch of symmetries that come about from the symmetries of the circularly polarized field. So all these mirror planes in the circular field make this PCD typically um, you know, forward, backward, asymmetric, left, right, up, down, symmetric. So when you use this locally chiral field that generally doesn't have any of these symmetries, you generate this completely asymmetric photoelectron spectra. And this means that when you integrate over all the angles, all the energies and so on, you still have an enantiosensitive signal, right? So you can get chiral sensitive ATI and then also total molecular ionization rates that are uh, enantiosensitive and you could potentially use this for enantioseparation. So Ofer has taken us from symmetry through to chir chirality. So I'm going to bring us back a little bit to the discussion of Taylor fields. But I'm not going to present what most people think about when they think of a Taylor field. Instead, I'm going to have two linearly polarized parallel positives. 
But the kind of special thing about them is that they are very short in duration. They're few cycle pulses. And when we have few cycle pulses, we can end up with observables, which I'll talk, explain in a little second, which are very strongly time delay dependent. So there's an overall lack of symmetry in the total response. So here I have an omega-2 omega scheme with six cycle sine squared envelope pulses. And I introduce the time delay between the pulses and I calculate the harmonic spectrum at each point of And then I stitch them all together. And you can see in the first instance, right in the largest plot, uh, my overall combined harmonic spectrum is incredibly time delay dependent. And this arises because in my different combined fields for the different time delays, I have a lack of repeating units in my overall electric field, which leads to this really non-symmetric behavior. If I, however, change my pulses, so I change their profile or I change the duration of some of them, I do start to get these repeating units in my combined electric field, and that results in a more regular pattern in my overall harmonic spectrum. Uh, and this is the kind of more difficult thing for me who only looks at at atomic calculations. How does an atomic physicist contribute to a discussion on chirality, symmetry, and Taylor fields? But I believe with the few cycle pulse case, this is perhaps something that's overlooked in the discussion of things like simmering, but it forms an important contribution. Perhaps the most important contribution, right, is the use of few cycle pulses to generate isolated atom second pulses, which we pretty much all heavily rely on to do a lot of this kind of work. But after talking about something that is very non-traditionally chiral and definitely not microscopic, I'm going to hand over to Mara for something very different. <laughs> So, hi. Um, we have already heard uh, Kathleen, Dino, and Ofer talk about Taylor fields, different kinds of Taylor fields, like fields with Taylor polarizations or mixing of frequencies of some temporal uh, shaping. But all of these are properties of the field at the local level, so at each point of the space. And here I'm going to talk about a different kind of Taylor fields that carry macroscopic properties, so they are related to global the global shape of the field, how this field, electric field changes spatial. And a very important example of this are vortex rims, which are known because they carry orbital angular momentum. They have these donut-like intensity uh, profiles with a zero in the center and a phase that varies asymmetrically in the transversal plane to propagation, where in the center we have a singularity of the phase. And the amount of rotation of, of the phase is connected to the orbital angular momentum that they carry. So they exhibit this twisted wave. So this is something that I guess more or less you all know. Uh, this kind of beams are uh, described as lagger gauss modes, where in this phase you can find the L, the orbital angular momentum, which is also often referred as the political charge, which is calculated as um, this integral of the phase gradient around the singularity. Okay, so instead of talking more in general about uh, vortex beams, uh, we want to raise a couple of topics that we think might be a bit controversial or interesting to discuss. So uh, the first thing is, uh, why is this topological like, why there is this connection between uh, topology and vortex beams? And Olga has already explained a lot about topology in her amazing tutorial. Uh, but let's discuss it a bit more. So uh, first, uh, I would like to raise this pool to uh, see what is your concept of topology and its connection to vortex beams. So let's consider that we have two uh, vortex beams with L equal to one, one of them, and L equal to minus one, uh, the other. And then we have here the intensity and phases uh, profiles. So uh, I like this. Uh, I would choose this example because here you can find that we see phase singularities. So if your concept of topology is related to phase singularities, you may think, okay, this is a topological like. But at the same time, we have a total topological charge equal to zero, a orbital angular momentum equal to zero. So maybe you can may think that this is not topological because we don't have a total topological charge different from zero. So this is the question. Do you think that this can be called topological light or not? Or maybe the question itself doesn't make much sense. Let's we'll see what you think. Okay, there seems to be an agreement so far. 
Okay, no? How do you define topological? Say mm -hmm. how do you define topological? Because That's the question. Yeah, well, well <laughs> We'll discuss a bit more after uh, the pool. But yeah, it's exactly maybe different people have different views on what. Yeah, because it's a, it's a buzzword in the community, but I've seen a lot of definitions of topological. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm asking you. I don't know if it's being picked up by the microphone, but how do you define topological? Well, in general, topology is a branch of mathematics that studies the properties of a Geometric objects that are conserved under certain deformations. So it's like an area of knowledge. So maybe you can call something topological if you can study it from that point of view and apply it topological properties to that and apply this a set of tools that topology has to study that object. But maybe I don't know different people have different opinions on, on that. Yeah, this one's pretty okay, so okay. We can stop oh. the poll probably. To be honest, I didn't quite get uh, it to which answer you counted uh, the answer. Uh, doesn't the qu the question does not make sense? Did that <laughs> did that count as part of answer one or answer two? Uh, no, I didn't. No, there is not such an option. Uh, but I wanted to include it. Okay. So the question is uh, well, I, I'm not going to say with, that this is the correct answer or this is the this other, but instead. Um, I like to uh, talk a bit more about the origins of talking about topological life when we talk about uh, vortex beams, and maybe you, can, you would change your mind or we can uh, discuss it later. So, uh, I think it's not the right thing. Okay. Okay. So wh why are we connecting vortex beams with topology? What's the historical origin of, of this? Uh, so uh, right after Jung discovered that light is a wave at the beginning of the 19th century, phase singularities started to be studied in different kind of waves, like sound waves or tides or wave functions. And uh, so the concept that uh, light as a wave can also have phase singularities started to be developed so that when Vortex beams started to be um, investigated. And then uh, in this uh, seminar paper, so I think this, well, the reference here is uh, moves a bit here. In this seminar paper by Nye and Derrick, they uh, draw a connection between phase singularities and wavefront dislocations, which are analogous to crystal dislocations. So then uh, they can start to apply um, topological properties to study these uh, phase singularities in connection with the fact that they are wave from these locations. And my, I think that this, this is kind of the origin where people started to talk about topology and then the, the definition of the topological charge to describe a vortex beams also uh, was uh, priced. But this is not the only kind of topological light that we can have. We can also have uh, beams where we have um, polarization singularities, such as in vortex, in vector beams, where we have these polarization patterns and in the center, we don't have um, defined polarization. And in this case, we define other topological properties, such as the Poincare index to characterize this. We can also combine a vortex, a vortex beams with polarization uh, to create these torus nodes, where, where we have this spatial variation of the trifold uh, shape. And in this case, it can be useful to, in order to define the topology of the beam, to think about the symmetries and the generator of these symmetries is going to give us information about the topology and about conserved quantities, which, by the way, is useful to investigate chirality as Olga explained. So basically, uh, depending on the different kind of light beam, we can define different topological properties and apply those to uh, understand our beam or the conserved quantities that we have, the symmetries that are going to result from our nonlinear interaction. So that's why it is, I think it is useful to think about uh, topology when we deal with uh, this kind of 
of beams. Uh, but I also think that it's important to define exactly what we mean when we say this is topological, which is the uh, conserved quantity that we have. This is the topological charge, or this is the one kind of index that we are defining. Um, well, this is my view, but maybe you may disagree and we can discuss that if you want now or later. Um, and the other topic about vortex beams that uh, we wanted to talk about is uh, if they are useful or not, which is also a bit controversial because this is a typical question that we always get. Are they really useful for something to use uh, vortex beams? So uh, on the one hand, there are uh, several kinds of applications uh, that are usually uh, used in the visible and infrared uh, regimes. Since we have uh, this uh, different kind of rotation uh, of the light in contrast to polarization, we can also imprint rotations to particles and use this for particle manipulation. But also uh, these vortex beams can transfer higher amounts of information compared to conventional light. And also they are more robust when they go through air turbulences. So that's why they can be useful for communications. Then um, they can also be useful for microscopy because they can allow us to get better contrast, contrast uh, in imaging because we have these phase uh, profiles or for quantum information. In this uh, orbital angular momentum is another quantum number that we can use. So all of these different applications have been studied. Uh, and when we um, want to combine vortex beams with nonlinear phenomena, we may think, well, what can we get from that? So the first thing that one can think is that we can try to extend these same applications to a different regime. So if we generate a stream with ultraviolet, a stream with ultraviolet vortex beams with very short directions, then we can bring these applications to the nanotechnology or to ultra-fast phenomena. But I think that's the, not the only thing that uh, we can do. But we can also use um, a vortex beams in another, from another perspective when we uh, do, for example, high harmonic generation or nonlinear phenomena in general. Because since we have this, uh, the, the most uh, relevant thing about uh, vortex beams or what it distinguishes them from other properties is the spatial distribution. And we can uh, take advantage of this to spatially control the radiation that is emitted. And spatially controlling them means, for example, to put some signal that we don't want, we can take it away in space, or we can create new interferences using this degree of control um, spatial. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. So for example, uh, the first thing that we can do is to control the spectrum of the harmonics using vortex beams. So usually we have the high harmonic generation with uh, all the old order harmonics, these combs, but if instead of using a Gaussian beam, we use this Nathalie's driving beam, which is basically a combination of two vortex beams that create this like flower-like um, beam, where in each petal we have a different phase. So the the um, this um, the way this emission from each petal interferes is going to determine which harmonics are going to survive and which are going to be uh, destructively uh, interfering because then we can get if we look at our harmonics comes we can see that some harmonics have been uh, interfering destructively and they disappear from the spectrum and others interfere constructively so by using vortex beams we can control other properties of the harmonics such as the spectrum but also we can control the polarization so before uh, offer explained that using this bicircular field, this trifold, you can generate circularly polarized harmonics, right? But you, you have uh, at the same time harmonics that are right circularly polarized and left other harmonics that are left circularly polarized all together. So when we look at the attosecond pulses that, uh, that are the combination of all of these harmonics, they are actually linearly polarized. If we want to generate attosecond pulses that are at, uh, circularly polarized, we need to separate the right circularly polarized harmonics from the left circularly polarized harmonics. Mm -hmm. And we can separate them spatially by using uh, a vortex beams. So then instead of having them all together, we are separating them, as you can see here, into uh, rings. So this is a way to generate circularly polarized second pulses in a collinear scheme. So we don't need to use non-collinear computer. So in general, 
uh, we can use uh, vertex beams to manipulate the spatial irradiation, and this can be useful for different uh, properties, not only spectrum or, or polarization, but also to investigate chiral molecules, etc. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, point out that when we deal with um, a structure light or vertex beams or light that in general has a strong spatial variation, as uh, was mentioned in here before, it is crucial to study the macroscopic effects because the field that uh, our, our target uh, fields uh, is going to change a lot spatially. And it's very important to see how all of these um, light emissions that are going to be very, very different are interfering. So when we use vortex beams, this is going to be important because we have this phase variation, and this is going to determine how is the spatial structure of the harmonics and the orbital angular momentum content. But also when we, for example, create this tailored uh, uh, fields with tailored polarization structure, these 3D polarizations, they are usually generated using non-collinear setups. And when we use a non-collinear setup, then we have a very strong spatial variation of the field. And it's going to be very important to do these macroscopic calculations. So uh, when dealing with the structured light, I would say that it's uh, super important to, to do macroscopic calculations. When we use Gaussian beams, maybe it's more uh, something that we can uh, discuss and uh, we have already discussed. Um, but I think that there are different effects that you have to take into account. And Catherine has already mentioned this. Uh, so in the, uh, the thing is that uh, when we do these calculations as, as they are very computationally demanding, uh, if we are interested in uh, studying a structure light, but we cannot afford this three-dimensional a macroscopic calculation, maybe we can restrict ourselves to do a calculation in a two-dimensional plane, and that can be a way to reduce a lot the computational efforts. But in general, I guess that uh, the more similar to the experiment, the calculation is the better because an experiment is going to be crucial to have good efficiency, and this is going to be determined by the medium length or the phase mismatch and other kind of effects. Yeah, so this brings us pretty much to the end of our panel part of the discussion. Uh, we just wanted to finish off with maybe a brief outlook on the field of chirality symmetries and field fields. Uh, so Olga has already given us a very great outlook in her, her tutorial as well. And as she pointed out, this area of research has really exploded in popularity in the past 10 or so years. Uh, and great progress has come with that too. And probably at the start of this um, chirality and symmetries were kind of treated as a separate topic within outer second science, but now they've kind of woven themselves in right across um, the ultrafast physics field of research. So some interesting things that chirality and symmetries have now been applied to are things like chiral vibrational dynamics, um, understanding ultrafast demagnetization. And now we also, with the advent of topological light or beams with orbital angular momentum, we have instead of circular dichroism, we can have things like helical dichroism that we can explore as well. So this brings us to the end of our panel part. Um, next, we have some quick, in just the remaining time, um, Manfred will keep us on track. We have some discussion prompts as well. So a few back and forward questions between the four of us, um, but where we'd also encourage the audience to participate too. And to come back to the biggest topic of contention, which maybe doesn't fit the theme too much, um, is the value of the single atom versus the macroscopic response. Okay, so for some of us, probably us atomic theoreticians, right? We think the single atom response is the most valuable. And perhaps microscopic effects are just consequences of the experimental set, okay? Uh, but Lara has put <laughs> <laughs> Laura has pointed out, okay, for topological light, of course, right, you have to account for the overall special distribution of the system. So I'm going to ask Dino, so nobody else was brave enough to share their opinion earlier. Dino, what, where do you fall on this discussion? Uh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of a good discussion. However, I would say that it's not really wise to say that the macroscopic response of the atom or molecule is not important. Definitely, it's not wise. It can affect the harmonic spectrum, for example, quite a lot. Uh, however, this is my this is why I am on the side of the microscopic single atom response. Uh, generally speaking, when we are discussing the macroscopic effects, we are solving the max. Uh, we are actually uh, 
uh, analyzing the Maxwell's wave, wave equation, there are generally two ways how we can do that. The first way is by uh, analyzing differential equations, you know, propagation, Frank Nicholson algorithm, and so on and so forth. And the second way we can proceed is by um, analyzing the integral equation, uh, the integral solution of such an equation. Uh, actually, we have we had a paper, I think one or two years ago, in which we analyzed the integral solution of the um, of the Maxwell's equation, and we had found what's expected, and that is that uh, the macroscopic spectrum is tilted. It's actually it's uh, the, the the harmonic emission rate, the macroscopic response decreases as the harmonic energy increases. While for the in the plateau region, while for the microscopic single atom response, the harmonic spectrum was flat. So that is completely true. However, besides that, we have also find, found that in the uh, macroscopic spectrum, it's not a monotonous degree uh, decrease of the harmonic yield, but the uh, the yield oscillates as a function of the harmonic energy. And that means that um, uh, the maximum which appears in such a spectrum depends, for example, on the position of the gas jet with respect to the focus of the, of the driving field. And that maximum is really close to the microscopic response. So why I personally think that um, single atom response is probably more important than the macroscopic response, because uh, in my papers, I usually want to find uh, the values of the parameters for which uh, the harmonics would have a significant intensity and ellipticity, for example. And in my opinion, the macroscopic effects would affect that, but they can be uh, they can be changed in such a way to obtain the significant harmonic intensity for a given value of the energy. For example, in in the case I've been uh, I've been talking about. Uh, the, the the place, the energy at which uh, this maximum appears strongly depends on the position of the uh, of the gas jet. That means that only by using one of the macroscopic parameters, we can definitely strong the macroscopic effect would be in a certain energy energy region. Not to mention the other parameters, the examples of which maybe maybe the most important pressure uh, of the of the of the uh, gas. So I would say that it is not wise to say that they are not important. They are quite important. They can they can definitely change the the the, the response, the, the 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 shape of the spectrum. However, for a particular value of the harmonic energy for which we are interested in, it's definitely possible to by changing the values of those parameters to control that and to obtain the significant harmonic intensity. So that's that's the reason why I am on the microscopic uh, response side. Uh, however, if some effect appears in the microscopic spectrum, it's definitely gonna be imprinted also in the macroscopic spectrum. It's gonna be imprinted there. You can you you can see, uh, for example, some minima which appear. Uh, they can be it can be slightly changed, but still. Uh, that, that's the reason why I am on that side, but still I wouldn't say that they are not uh, they are not important at all. I wouldn't say that. So uh, I mean we, I, we okay. can agree uh, about that. Is the idea that that there are more votes from you guys, or should we ask the audience? The audience? You yeah. Can ask the audience yeah. So can... yeah, now let's ask the audience. Olga, do you have a short opinion on this? Yeah, I just yeah. mentioned. I just wanted to mention that if we didn't have propagation effects, we would never have other. That's true. So many, so many opinions. Thank you. I'll also attempt a short response. Um, the whole point of harmonic generation is it's the coherent addition from many emitters. Therefore, it's absurd to imagine you can separate the macroscopic from the single emitter response. And I don't think it's a healthy or sensible idea to pursue. Of course, there are many situations where we can make what we measure in the laboratory quite close to the single atom or single emitter response, but never be deluded to imagine that one is unimportant and the other is very important. Thank you. There was one vote. Maybe not a vote, but a question kind of following up on your response. Do you think then um, 
their uh, single atom theoreticians have a bit have a should have a little bit more of a responsibility to try to describe what more specifically what conditions in the lab they would want or need uh, uh, to kind of get out, <laughs> get out those responses. To be quite honest, there is a huge number of papers about these macroscopic effects, uh, a really a huge number of them, uh, discussing the problem from different perspectives, different points of view. Um, am I satisfied with all, all those approaches? Yes. and. And yes and no, I think that there are a lot of more things to do and to analyze, but still uh, the field has been explored quite extensively and kind of it's like not really interesting these, these days anymore. Okay, so I, I think I would actually like to turn this question around because I mean, I think you're putting it like um, we do the single atom response, that's important. And then we see if the macroscopic world um, will change anything or not. I think maybe we should take the question the other way around also. Are there any effects that maybe can be completely understood just by doing the macroscopic response? Maybe um, maybe in, in what Laura has explained, something like this can happen. And maybe it's not important how the single atom response looks like. So uh, would you say such a situation exists? Yeah, I mean, sometimes if, if you just study the symmetries of your system, when you have a topological light, you can, from that, determine the symmetries that the light emission is going to have. For example, and that is, that is related to the macroscopic shape of the beam. So in the sense of uh, symmetries, you can, uh, um, for example, define some conserved quantities that you're going to have. Uh, it's a bit diff difficult to think if you don't have any information about the single atom response at all, how is them going to be the how the macroscopic uh, emission is going to be apart from that geometrical uh, intuition that you can get from symmetries? But I don't know, maybe there are other options. Okay, so maybe you should continue, otherwise we will uh, not get through the questions. Sure. So this is a question for Laura. So she's presented some really nice applications of beams with orbital angular momentum. Um, and she has, you know, given some of the positives of why we might want to use them over other different configurations of light. But are there any applications for which beams with orbital angular momentum are the only kinds of beams you can use? So is it worth the hassle of having to work with this topological light either in the lab or as a theoretician? What's the one sort of defining thing that will set them apart, the one application? Um, so uh, in general, I think uh, using, uh, for example, vortex beams is using a different tool to what uh, we all had in, uh, already. For example, uh, we, when we manipulate the polarization of the frequency and other properties of the electric field, we are always manipulating properties that are local. And uh, when we manipulate, when you use vortex beams, we are using a field where we have, are taking advantage of, of the spatial distribution in a way that is uh, st stable and robust. So it's a different kind of tool. So I think they are complementary. We don't, it's different. It's difficult to think, okay, no, but we cannot, uh, we are going to forget about vortex beams. Let's use polarization is, instead. Maybe in some cases you can do that. And for example, to create um, the circularly polarized harmonics, we can also use the second passage, you can also use a non-collinear scheme uh, without using vortex beams. But this has also the, uh, some disadvantages or advantages depending on the case. But in general, it's like um, if you have a set of tools and polarization, for example, is the screw driver, then orbital angular momentum is a, a range, which also improves rotation, but in a more macroscopic way. So you can, uh, use different tools for different situations, and sometimes using vortex beams is going, is going to be very important and an advantage, uh, in such as in some of the applications that I mentioned, where you can get better results if you, if you use vortex beams. So I think it's important to have all the tools, and then you can build whatever using them in different ways because they are different and complementary. Can I also add something, maybe? So, like, I think the combination is really. A powerful thing when you have both because like if you think about okay polarization is very important it allows us to control the microscopic response so once you have these topological beams or let's say macroscopic objects where you can control the light field 
uh, in space, then you can also control the polarization in every point in space, right? So there's a bunch of examples, but like one paper comes to mind from, from the Corcoran group where they do this tailored polarization with a vector beam, right? So they do an omega two omega field, which breaks this inversion symmetry in every point in space, but then the beam has this overall like polarization that's rotating around the vortex. So they can use this to control and, and generate like electric currents, you know, and magnetic fields. And so this is just like the combination of the two gives a very strong uh, tool. Yeah. Yeah, because um, you see in vortex beams, not only just having a different phase and that's it, as you said, you can use this spatial variation to vary other properties. Yeah. Uh, when well, you combine well, the phase it. is the polarization, right? I mean, that's. Mm -hmm. Any opinions from the audience? Uh, yeah, so regarding this question, I would like to point out that there are uh, structured beams where you can control, I mean, the, the ratio between the electric and the magnetic component is different. So you can have, for example, regions in the beam where you only have magnetic field. And this is something that you can definitely not do with, without the OAM or more in general with structured light. Thank you. So maybe I think it's good to move on yeah. because we have a few more questions. Well, okay, I think this is one. Three, this three, is one that I'm, okay, so Laura. So what happens if you photoionize a chiral molecule with light that does have orbital angular moments? So typically, if you do this just with circularly polarized light, you get PCD, right? And then I guess this is more of an exploratory question, yeah. Yeah, I think... Um, uh... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you'd think, well... No, sorry, no. I was going to say, so, so the, two op the two options, either you get PCD or not, right? So on one hand, you'd think that you would get PCD because the light is, is helical, right? It has this, like skewed uh, phase front, and this should generate some chiral response. This is what makes sense. But then on the other hand, electrons don't interfere. Um, and actually, this has not been done experimentally yet, or there, there are also no theory predictions. So it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. out there. I don't know. Yeah. And also, like, uh, the vortex is, is a very big uh, uh, object. Like, yeah. the molecule is going to be very small compared to how the phase changes. And in order for so the molecule, in order to feel that the uh, rotation is going has to feel this phase gradient. And um I guess the effects would be even if it, you forget about uh, the fact that, that the, the electron can interfere, the, I guess that you would need a very strong phase gradient or a lot of intensity to be able to actually measure that. But I don't know, I think it's maybe it's worth exploring. I think someone should do it. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Any opinion from the audience on this question? I guess you're talking about linearly polarized. Yeah, linearly polarized case. beam with an orbital angle. Moment. Let's say L equals one. You know, so we're on the same. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to point out there is a very nice uh, nature physics. I think from Majat Chergui group. Uh, they studied um, XUV with X-rays photonization uh, with orbital angular momentum beams. And I think they had a very beautiful vision that, uh, so they had a randomly oriented ensemble of molecules. And uh, what they show that to include this uh, orbital angular momentum effects, you need basically multipolar expansion. But at some point, you really speak about exciting spatial currents with this field. Mm -hmm. So, and it is a fit between spatial currents that you excite and the chirality of the molecule. I, I think it's a very, very beautiful work. Mm -hmm. But of course, you need a high frequency to, to rely on the spatial yeah, structure. Yeah. And what they point out that previously, it was hard to see uh, quadrupole effects, well, quadrupole effects impossible to see randomly oriented molecules, but what they see, they see higher order effects. Basically, the entire spatial shape of the current is imprinted into the response, and I find that this is really very exciting. Just 
just a comment that you can turn it on its head and measure the orbital angular momentum of the electron, and then that gives quite a strong chiral response. That's something else to consider. Okay, that mm -hmm. makes the people think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, yeah, my mind blown. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Good. So maybe let's move on if you have Are we more. Still on time? We have a couple more questions. questions. Okay. <clears throat> well, during our presentation, okay. uh, during our presentation, we have actually presented the uh, high, we have actually talked about high order harmonic generation. And uh, in particular, my colleague and I, we are actually uh, calculating the harmonic spectrum using two different methods. My colleague, she's actually using an um, uh, R matrix theory, and I'm using um, actually single active electron approximation, uh, an SFA, strong field approximation. And uh, this is my, uh, my actually question. How, how do we really need uh, full uh, R matrix theory with respect to the uh, single, atom, uh, single active electron response. This is, um, in my opinion, uh, when we are talking about single active electron response, we are using as the ground state the wave function of the balance outermost electron. Uh, we can we can um, present that that function as a linear combination of some kind of a basis function or so on and so forth. However, in the R matrix theory, they are actually doing a lot more job. Uh, they are actually dividing the whole space into two regions. We had a lecture earlier today. Um, in the inner region, they are they want to ensure to have a multi-electron wave function. That means that correctly um, take into account the interactions between the electrons, between the active electron and all other electrons which remain in the vicinity of the of the uh, nucleus. However, in the outer region. Uh, they neglect th those interactions. So my um, question is, is that really necessary? Because I would expect that the only differences appear in the low energy part of the spectrum and maybe some quantitative differences for the, for the plateau harmonics and maybe the position of the cutoff. So uh, the question is, yes, of course, that the results would be slightly different because you have a more complete description of the atom uh, exposed to the laser field. But how significant is that, that difference? Yeah, do you know, I think for most applications um, or for most harmonic spectra that you will calculate, that is totally right. Okay, so things okay. can be described well in a single atom response uh, through a strong field approximation, okay. but there are examples of the manifestation of multi electron effects in the harmonic spectrum. Okay. And these are the things, you know, unless you use a code capable of describing these multi-electron effects, you don't know if they're there or not. Um, so some examples include so some of the work, I guess, Hugo showed as well. So things like XUV assisted or initiated high harmonic generation, where you can have perhaps correlation between inner and outer electrons can then affect the shape of the harmonic spectrum. That would be an important application, mm -hmm. which you can then get with a single active electron approach. Um, but I'd say, yeah, you're right. I, I did mention earlier, right? If I have a hammer, I think everything is a nail. I would do every single harmonic calculation with a multi-electron method. But at the end of the day, is it necessary? No, it's not. If we did expand the question though, and this is another point that Hugo made as well, I guess the R matrix of time dependence is kind of large selling point as well, is that it's not just appropriate for describing strong field processes. Okay, so it can look at few photon or single photon processes like rabbit as well. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a much larger, maybe more difficult question to answer is where do you invest your time and your effort in your code development in a maybe single use, but or single application, but very accurate code? Or do you go for a more general one that maybe can answer some problems as efficiently or as well? Just maybe it's my curiosity now. Uh, can you see the difference? For example, if you use, for example, neon atom, a very simple one, and uh, someone which uh, xenon, which is more complex, can you see the difference that here, where you have more electrons, that the effects are more pronounced? Yes, I think there's that example. Is it the giant resonance? Uh, okay, it's in, in xenon. Yeah, yeah, I know that paper. <laughs> I know that paper. Yeah, that's, xenon. that's the quintessential one. Yeah, that's, that's the very. <laughs> It's a very bad example. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need correlations. Yeah, you don't need correlations. It's a very yeah. bad example because yeah. it yeah. it's yeah. fully described within the single active. So you have a bunch of single active okay. electrons, but they're not interacting. You just need them to interfere. Yeah. 
I have personally, I think, a lovely example, but it's not yet published. <laughs> okay. There's some, there's some examples of like a potential, you know, secondary plateau in helium. It's not mm -hmm. been measured yet. And there's some other, some, you know, there's some example, like some modulations in the yields of harmonics. Or... But I want to ask a critical question here. Um, I mean, to me, the, the, this choice of methods, it, it looks a bit random somehow, right? It's only two of, of many possibilities. Anyway, um, you yourself have earlier um, shown this question. If you put a linear molecule in a linearly polarized field, will the result be uh, elliptically polarized or not? And, and the answer was no. And uh, and I think you said that in the strong field approximation, you can get this answer. But if I remember correctly, this will depend a lot how you do the SFA in detail. You can do it in different gauges and, and different, uh, you can use dipole moments or velocities. And uh, I think if you do it in the wrong way, you will get zero, actually. And I think it depends a lot how mm -hmm. you do it exactly. So I would say for this question, I would personally say the SFA is not reliable because it can give you random answers. <laughs> and, yeah. then, and I might even go as far as saying that maybe in that case, multi-electron effects can become important because like small changes of the yeah, return yeah. of the electron could could influence the, the answer. Would you agree with that? Uh, I would. Uh, that's something what should I should think a bit more. However, what uh, I think is that they are elliptically polarized. Uh, but the uh, the only effect is here: is the theory good enough to predict the uh, linear polar uh, elliptical polarizations? They the harmonics generated with molecules. They are a linearly polarized field. They are elliptically polarized because that's spotted in, the, in an experiment. But it is possible that some that the theory is maybe not good enough to confirm that elliptical polarization. So that's possible. I, I, I think I, I've never I've never worked with a velocity gauge, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I usually work with the length gauge, and so it still yes. depends. Good. I think we should. Uh, I think we, we don't have so much time. Maybe we should move on. Uh, I think it's the last question. Yes, yeah, sorry. Is it? I think there is one more. Yeah, yeah no, the next one's the last one. Yeah. So this is. The question doesn't want to be asked. No. <laughs> this is the problem. So this is a question for Offer. Uh, what is your view on the topological life? But, uh, do you think that topological protector with the quantities in the Okay. I'm not sure I'm the qualified person to answer, but I will try. So I have an opinion. Um, but yeah, so is there anything topologically protective about topological? But this is connected to a deeper question, which is like, what is topological about so called like orbital angular momentum light? Um, so I would say, kind of mathematically, so you can define a topological invariance. So you can define in some space something that that's a number that that's quantized and that's topological, um, and in that sense, like the beam is topological and it has some orbital angular momentum, and you can't remove it. Like it's protected in the sense that you would only remove it if it interferes with something which has the opposite, like minus orbital angular momentum. But I would say that it's not exactly the kind of prototypical benchmark thing that you would think about when you think about topology. Like for me, if someone tells me topology, and I guess the majority of physicists, they would think, okay, condensed matter. So this is kind of the first place where topology was really making a lot of kind of uh, significant contributions. Um, and there the story is different. So the protection there is different. So if you have like a condensed matter or some solid that that's topological, then its topological properties are inherent from its ground state. And this means that there's some associated like topologically protected states that are protected by time symmetry and they can't be removed from the system. But this is not exactly the same as what you have with topological beams. And another thing I think that is quite interesting to think about, if you try to think about like the topology of topological beams, is that like the singularity, so like the actual singularity of what you would think is topological. So it's not, as far as I understand, it's not a real singularity, right? So whenever you have some phase singularity, some polarization singularity, kind of the intensity of light in that place is always zero. 
or you know, it's fine. Like the beam is always continuous. The electromagnetic field is always real and continuous. There's nothing really singular about it. Whereas like in the condensed matter case, let's say there, there is an actual singularity you can't gauge away. So like those two, I think are, are like good points to think about. Okay, I think we should move on. Uh, was this the last question yeah. that you prepared? And I think you just had this last slide. Good. Um, so first of all, let me thank these four brave people that they were going into this. Um, I think the, the fights were not so, uh, so, <laughs> so severe, but, um, I think we learned a lot anyway, uh, since we have spent a lot of time already, I think maybe it's good to move the discussion into the coffee break. If you have more comments, more questions, approach us, them and, and, and ask, and, uh, when do we continue? <laughs>